And man, Lego land. Thank God for outings like that once a year. Amen. <laughs> and they got a chance to go to Legoland and they got a chance to watch a 4D movie and got a chance to get inside Legoland and run around and play and do all of those things that kids love to do and uh, just wore, wore themselves out. And then we got a chance to um, uh, do some other things while we were down there. We had some other family that was with us and spent some family time together. And, you know, that's always good to be able to just get away and not have any schedule, so to speak, um, to do those things. But how many of you know vacation time ends and it's time to kind of recuperate from that? And you get your work weekend. My wife and I uh, had uh, decided to take a time of having a, some time away for just me and her. And we uh, attended a marriage retreat over in Tulsa, a little town there called Katusa. Um, and we went to the Hard Rock Hotel there is where they had the marriage retreat. The leaders of the uh, conference said we, we decided to bring church to the casino. <laughs> and so we, we had a good time at the, at the marriage retreat there. And the marriage was, uh, had a theme to it. Uh, predominantly African-American marriage retreat, but there were uh, all races there, but predominantly uh, black and white because people uh, were uh, coming from all over the country. And the marriage title, the theme for the weekend was, What Kind of Marriage Do You Have? Uh, Taken from the movie Wakanda, right? What kind of marriage do you have? What kind of marriage do you desire? And so they had these keynote speakers who were excellent, who came, and they were all pastors, uh, except for one who was a psychologist, but he was a, really a minister, him and his wife out of Atlanta, Georgia. He's one of the uh, psychologists that uh, works, contributes to Dateline on, uh, uh, in the ABC Evening News. So he's a really well-known uh, psychologist, and those people just really imparted their selves into our lives and spoke into our lives and we just had a great time and we really enjoyed being refreshed and having that time of way and so um, my brother and his wife were able to come along with us and and just enjoy uh, their time with us as well and how many of you know it's good when your brothers marry sisters that you can do that kind of stuff sometimes right so it was a lot of fun being able to get away but nonetheless we still missed our oasis family and being here and we are glad to be back with you today and looking forward to what God wants to share from his heart today. You know, I, I believe that this might be the shortest service that we have had in a long time. I'm not going to keep you long, and I'm not going to uh, drag out or stall to try to make time fit what I have. I'm just going to honor what God has given me, and um, God used me. I pray that God would use me as he chooses to use me, even with what he's prepared for you today. I pray that it will be a blessing to your heart. Let's just pray right before we give the Lord word. Lord, we just thank you this morning, Father. Thank you for this series that we've been in about the fear of the Lord. Father, I don't know if it's ministered to anyone else's heart specifically about doing anything differently in their walk with you but for me father i know that the word has challenged me to look deep into the walls of my heart and to to measure and to examine my intentions my thoughts my beliefs and my actions when it comes to fearing you And Father, I'm thankful for this series. I'm thankful for your word that you have given to us and that you've shared through the ministry here at the church. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that every person who has had the opportunity to hear this series, that they have grown and they have been encouraged to walk in a reverence like they haven't walked before. And Lord, that they would see a manifestation of your grace and your mercy and even your demonstration in their lives. Father, I pray that you would set on this house this morning, that the Holy Spirit would move up and down each 
in every aisle and that it would cause the hearts who have been yielded to you to be pricked so that they may receive your word. We give you all the praise and the glory for it in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. The title of this message is The Fear of the Lord. Simply known. Is that the fear of the Lord known? I got this title simply from some questions that the Lord began to ask me as I was preparing this message. And it, at the root of it was a question that the Lord asked me in many different ways. And the question was, do you know me? And do you know that you are known by me? I know you. I know you better than you know yourself. And as he began to ask me these questions, and I began to come to a real understanding. How many know you can understand some things, but then there's a place where you can come to a real understanding that your understanding may be limited at a different time in your life, but when you are exposed to the word and it brings light into your heart, then you can come into a more real understanding of what God is communicating to you. The first question the Lord asked me, and I wrote these down as they, as I received them, do you know exactly what you want in this life? And they were coming, I was telling Pastor Zach this, they were coming quick fire, quick succession, just one after the other. Sometimes the Lord speaks to you that way, and at least to me, and sometimes it's rare when it happens, but I want to, I know he's got my attention. Do you know exactly what you want in this life? If you do, what is it? Do you have it? If you don't have it, how do you plan to get it? If you've already have it and you've received it, are you happy with it now? And the question came after I began to give some answers, of course, in my own heart. Now, do you really know what you want in this life? Because obviously my answer was no, I don't know, and I don't have. I thought I've had it. How many of you can agree with that? I thought I've had it. I thought I've known exactly what I wanted. And the question came, now do you really know what you want in life? God knows better than we do of what we really need. We can go home on that right there. Because he knows what's best for us. And as I begin to think about that, I was recalled to a passage of scripture that I've recently listened to. And I'm going to go to it right now. We will go back into it from the beginning. But we're going to start in Numbers chapter 11, verse 31 through 35. I don't know if you've realized it or not, but... Uh, throughout our messages, as we have talked about the fear of the Lord, there's one place that we have been revisiting, Pastor Zach and I, unbeknownst to one another, but yet the Holy Spirit is moving and still ministering to us, and we're, we're landing on the same place. And that is the heart of the children of Israel, how we've kept revisiting those uh, places and I've had the opportunity to listen to Pastor Zach's message from last week. And, and um, I saw that he did this. He was right back there. And that's what we're talking about here in Numbers 11. Uh, those of you who have little titles in your Bible, this is the quail and the plague. It says in verse 31, Then a wind from the Lord sprang up and brought quail from the sea and let them fall beside the camp about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, around the camp and about two cubits above the ground, and the people rose all day and all night 
and all the next day and gathered the quail. Those who gathered least or the least of them were able to gather 10 homers. That's about six gallons of quail. And they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. While the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. Therefore, the name of that place was called Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had the craving. From Kibroth Hatava, the people journeyed to Hazaroth, and they remained at Hazaroth. Just so you can understand the context of what has happened here in the last, uh, one of the last verses of that particular chapter, God has sent Moses to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt. They had been slaves in captivity and in bondage for centuries. We're all well aware of that. If you've been in church in any, at any length of time, you've been in Bible study and in vacation Bible school, you've learned that in a, at an elementary level. And you know that Moses went and he was told by God, um, I'm calling you to be a deliverer for my people. And he was sent into the king's palace, into the Pharaoh's land, into Egypt to tell the king that God said, let my people go. And we know the story of all the plagues and the resistance of the Pharaoh. And finally, the Pharaoh says, okay, be gone with you. And these people left. And they left Egypt to go into the desert to be told where they would go from there. Amen? Ever had those two be determined? And that's why the people, left. they were so ready to leave and get out of bondage and happy and ready and loaded up wagons and kids and sleds and anything they could move with and bring family along, and they were on their way out. How many of you have watched that movie with Charleston Heston and seen that great movie of him coming out of Egypt? Some of you are too young to remember that. Uh, how about the Prince of Egypt? Okay, the, the, that has a scene in that as well, that animated cartoon about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt into the desert. They were coming out of Egypt. Egypt represents and symbolic of the world. It represents bondage and slavery in our lives. And God's desire is that we move out of bondage, out of slavery, into his freedom. Amen? So Egypt is representative of the world in bondage. And they were led into the wilderness. The wilderness is the desert. And it is where the testing is done. Anytime you see the world, the, the, the wilderness uh, alluded to in the word of God, it's always symbolic of a place of testing where God tests the hearts of men. Testing what? He's testing our hearts, meaning not our physical hearts, but our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. He is testing what we really believe. He's, exp he's putting us in a place where he is going to reveal himself if we're willing to endure the discomfort of that desert place. Amen? Do you remember in John how Jesus was baptized? And the Bible says the clouds open and, the, and the, the spirit of God like a dove came descending down on Jesus. Amen? And then you, they heard a voice and it was God speaking to those who were there who said, this is my son whom I am well pleased, hear him. You remember that? What happened immediately after that? Anybody know? That's right. He was led into the wilderness. By the spirit that fell upon him, he was led into the wilderness. For what? For a testing. Jesus, 
the Son of God, the only Son of God who came, who died for our sins, who was seated at the right hand of the Father, he went through a testing? Absolutely. He went through a testing because it was God's plan. And if it's God's plan for his only begotten son, aren't we joint heirs with that son? So why do we think we would be excused from a testing of our own hearts? Amen? God puts us in a place where James says we can count it all joy when we go through trials or testings, right? Because he's working out of us something so that he can work into us what he desires. Now, why would God deliver the people from Egypt and take them from a place where they had access to all of these resources, even though they were in bondage, and remove them and pull them out into a desert place where they were completely limited on resources? I don't know about you, but when I think about a desert, I think about sand everywhere. Maybe some hills, rocks, and some lizards and maybe some maybe a cactus or two but i when i think of a desert i don't think of a, a place that i desire to go hang out amen i definitely don't think of a place that i desire to travel through amen and we have a place here somewhere outside of arizona between arizona and california called death valley you've heard of that before isn't that a beautiful title beautiful name what do you think it means? <laughs> it means exactly what it says. It's a death valley, and that is a place where they are. Uh, it's very desolate, and you better be fueled up when you go through there, and you better have some resources with you. And I'm sure the children of Israel, knowing that they had a journey before them, had some limited resources. But how many of you know it comes to a point where you're out there, out there in the desert, and your, your resources, your supply begins to, to dwindle? And that's exactly what began to happen to the children of Israel. So why would God take them out there? He took them out there for a specific reason. So that they could take the limits off of him. So that they could take the limits off of him because as you think God is, he will be in your life. You will limit God in your life based on your own way of thinking. Exodus 3 7 through 10 says, Then the Lord said, I have seen how cruelly my people are being treated in Egypt. This is why the Lord delivered the people. I have heard them cry out to be rescued from their slave drivers. I know all about their suffering. Say, I know. I know all about their sufferings, and so I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of Egypt <clears throat> to a spacious land, one which is rich and fertile, in which the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites now live. I have indeed heard the cry of my people, and I see how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now I am sending you to the king of Egypt so that you can lead my people out of this country. That is the reason why the Lord delivered the children of Israel because he had heard their cries. God wants to move on our behalf and he is willing to move on our behalf. You ever heard that saying, a closed mouth doesn't get fed? We respond, we cry out to him, and he hears our cries, and he answers in his timing. It's in this place, this desert place, that all of their intentions are exposed. Their very hearts are confronted with the question of, who am I, who is he, and what do I really believe? God could not bring a worldly mindset of slavery, of captivity, of limited things on God into the promised land. That is why God didn't just say, here's Egypt, 
we're just going to take this one day trip and we're going to be in a promised land. God could have done that. He could have provided his own place for them. But God's desire is for them to understand that they could not go into the place that he desired them to go with the same mindset that they have had. And what you would say, well, that you can't blame those people for that, Lord. They've been in captivity for centuries. You can't blame them for having a, a, a way they've and a way that they've been raised. There's people who will come out of who are in ghettos and and they are on welfare and and there are people who point critical fingers at them and they're stuck in a particular mindset is the reason why they remain in the place that they're in. They have access to everything anyone else has access to. Amen. But because of a mindset, they have limited themselves on, in stepping out and walking in what God has provided for everyone else. Amen? And that's the same way it is with our hearts as we come out of the world. We limit God because of what we've experienced in the world. And God said these people will not go into the promised land with that mindset. Have you ever heard the term, one bad apple spoils the bunch? Just like one bad apple spoils the bunch, a single mindset, one mindset could taint, pollute the minds of others who were going into the promised land. That is the reason why they could not all enter into the promised land. Isaiah 15, says, do not be deceived. Bad company, and that's not the correct scripture. Bad company correct, corrupts good morals. I believe it, that's in 1 Corinthians. That's a mistype on my part. Have you ever reminisced about the old days before you were saved? Come on now. You get in a conversation, you see someone, you go to a high school class reunion, you see someone you haven't ran into in years, and next thing you know, you're talking about what you did, you used to do before. And it's okay. That's a memory. But the problem is, is when we reminisce about the way we were and we see some element of the light in our lives before we became saved. We don't want to glory in that. Amen? How many of you have, have been in that place? I've been in that place where I boasted, boy, I was something else, boy. And I boast in that, only to come full circle and say, well, Lord, what was I thinking? Forgive me for having that that moment of trying to be rebel in the glory of my days before you. Amen? We reminisce. Have you ever complained about how some things were better back then before you became a believer, before you became a follower of Jesus Christ? You don't complain about everything. You just complain about a little bit. You know what I'm saying? You, 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 you think about how you had more freedom back then. There seemed to be a little less concern, a little less, I don't know, um, uh, standards, boundaries set in my life. I didn't have to worry about what others thought about what I was doing. I didn't have to worry about what others thought about. Isn't that Dwayne over there? Isn't he the pastor of Oasis? What's he doing with his windows down listening to that music all that? Huh? And you're concerned about how people might see me. Why? Because we have the word of God in our hearts. And the word of God's going to bring conviction to our hearts. Yes, there are times when we've all reminisced. And that's what happened here. These people got to a place where they begin to romanticize about the old life in bondage. And they begin to Consider the old life that they had. Verse 4 of Hebrew, um, Numbers 11 says, Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt and, the, and that it cost us nothing. The cucumbers, mm, the melons, the leeks. The onions. I remember anyone ever done that? And you look back at things like, oh, I remember when I used to have this. Now that I'm on this diet, 
now that I'm trying to eat right, I can't, oh, man, my mouth waters just thinking about it. And that's exactly what they were doing. They were saying these things, but here is the key thing. The verse before that, the passage before that, in verse 1, it says, And the people complain in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortune. Now, here's the people who've just been delivered out of Egypt, and here they are into their journey for some time now. We don't know exactly. And they are now complaining about their past experiences. They're complaining in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortune. You've been delivered from the hands of Pharaoh, where you were making bricks out of straw and mud, where you were getting your backs lashed, and all you can think about are onions and leeks and melons and how you miss the taste of a good hamburger. And you're out in the middle of the desert. Isn't it funny? The things that we can complain about when we find ourselves facing a little bit of discomfort. Isn't it funny the things that we can reminisce and romanticize of back when we were in bondage because we have a little discomfort in our freedom, a little struggle in our walk with God. Amen? See, see, you're not, You're not the first to romanticize about your life in bondage and the discomfort, and the discomfort that liberty brings. God knew that everyone that went into the wilderness were not going to go through the wilderness. Can I say that? Can I say that? God knew that everyone who went in into, into the wilderness were not going to come out on the other side. If you think if about, you think it, about it, it, so there's some people in this church right, church right now. Some people in your life right, right now that start starting their faith walk with you that are no longer no walking walk with, walk with, with you. It doesn't mean that you haven't you arrived, arrived yet. It doesn't mean that God doesn't, doesn't want them, 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 them to be free. free. But what, what it does, does mean, it's mean it's a, it's a, you've come you've further, further than, than you think you have. You have. And it does mean that everyone says yes to God in the beginning doesn't say yes to God during the testing. So there's one there's thing to say yes to God, God during the beginning. beginning. There's a whole other thing to say yes to God during the test. testing. We say yes to God during the testing because our hearts are good with him. Not everyone, Not everyone has, has a heart that's good with him. Remember lies a lot. Deliver Set free, Set free, given a place, given a place to, go. to go. But she could not go because her heart was still in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now that's not to say that some people who started their walk with you haven't been the ones who have been there to encourage you along the way. Those who have been there to tell you not to go back because God didn't bring you out to leave you in the wilderness. Not to go back because he wouldn't bring you this far to leave you alone. Amen? We thank God for those who said yes to us, to him in the beginning, and who are still walking alongside of us today. Amen? Remember Naomi and Ruth. There are those that God calls alongside of us that are there for the simple reason to encourage us. Amen? It could be so easy for us to look at people and to be critical of them because they're not pulling the weight that we're pulling. But maybe we're there for them to encourage them and take on a little bit more weight for the time being. And then when we're unable to do that, they're able to take up some of that weight. What do I mean? I'm talking about accountability. I'm talking about encouraging one another. That is why it's so critical for you and I not to complain when we find ourselves in that testing place. Philippians 2, 14 through 15 says, Do all things without grumbling and without disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You have a testimony that may not even be spoken with words but it's spoken with your action. Man, how is she going through that? She just lost her husband. 
How are they going through that with they just filed bankruptcy? How are they able to do that and she's not even married, she's got a baby? They brought that on themselves, and they did. But God still loves them. And in the midst of that, they're walking it out. And if they're not complaining, you better not be pointing your finger and complaining about it. Amen? James 1, James 1 as I referred to earlier, says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. How many want to be in that place? Perfect and complete and lacking nothing. Now, as I mentioned, the Bible says in verse 4 of Numbers 11, Now the rabble was among them, and they had a very strong craving. Does anyone know what the rabble means? The rabble means... People who were not Israelites. They were maybe Egyptian and Jewish or Hebrew. And they didn't have a particular people they belonged to solely. So they were a mixed breed. And then there were probably others in there. Maybe some people of other tribes that were among the people of Israel who had been caught some way, somehow in captivity, and they lived with the children of Israel. And when they were brought out of bondage, they come along with them. Amen? So the rabble were considered to be other people. The rabble refers to those who were not yet the children of Israel. They were other people groups that had been taken captive and dwelled among the Israelites. Now, before you go thinking that God didn't care for the other people, remember that you and I are also the other people. Amen? I don't want to overstate it and believe that someone in here isn't of Jewish descent, but if you're not of Jewish descent, you are other people. Amen? You are what the word calls a Gentile. You have been grafted into the body of Christ. God did care for these people, even though they may have been considered other. Remember that the same God who delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh delivered these other people along with the Israelites. The death angel passed over them, and those who uh, put uh, the blood to hiss up on their doorpost, the death angel passed over them, and they were protected too. God delivered them, and they walked through the Red Sea on dry ground just like the Israelites did. These other people, this rabble group, they, the God was a, 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 a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night for them too. So before you get to a place where you point at those people and say, oh, it was the group, the others that were among them that were the problem. No, they were only the ones who instigated it. How I many you know? It takes two to tango. You don't have to buy in unless you want to buy in. Amen? See, today we seemingly have a harmless undercurrent of singling out those who are called other, those who seem different than us, those who may wear uh, hijab, hijab, if I'm saying it right, those who, who may have other beliefs than our beliefs, those who may think differently than what we think, those who may not seem as devoted to the same causes that we are devoted to. It's easy for us to get into a place where we point out the others. We have to be careful in the church that we don't take the lead from the political world and think that American patriotism and Christianity are one and the same. Can I get an amen? They are not. The Bible doesn't say that Jesus Christ died for America only. God gave his son, his only begotten son, because he loved the, loved the, for God so loved the, can I get a little louder, a little bit more conviction, for God so loved the, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loved you and I, he loved his people, and outside of his people, are us, and we're the others. 
and he loved us. Amen? I love my country, and I'm proud to be an American. But being an American won't save my soul. Amen? I'm thankful for the men and women, including my family members, who have served this great country, who have gone into battles, who have fought in wars, who have given their lives, but none of them, none of their bloodshed, will get me across the finish line in heaven. Amen? Yet I'm thankful for where God's placed me. So be careful of what we think about others. Amen? You know, it's funny. People can look at you one way at one certain time, and then they can see you in a completely different way when just a little bit changes. My wife and I were at this conference, and we had this Saturday night where we dressed in African attire. And as I mentioned, it was called Wakanda, so it was the Wakanda night. And all of us were putting on, and we were, my wife and I were running around trying to find, where we got no African attire, what are we going to wear? <laughs> We need to go get go need to go get something, and we got these uh, tops that are called dashikis. They used to be real popular in the 70s. I do remember they used they really used to be popular, and everyone wore dashikis. But we went and found these dashikis in the African store, and um, and then there were some people who they they went. You know, they went to a whole nother level. They were wearing the full African garb and the hats and the and the the big long uh, mumus or whatever they call the, the the all the garb, and it had it on. And even uh, some of the ladies had some of the uh, paint and stuff on their faces. And I can recall my wife and I walking through the casino. Friday and a Friday night before the Saturday morning and people smiling. How you doing? Good to see you. Hey, good. How y'all doing? And there was a host of us, you know, people moving from room to room for our, our marriage conferences and our breakout groups and so on and so forth. But that night when we walked through there in an African garb and there were people walking through there and we're all gathered together there were people who were like stepping out of the way and we get mm. and we weren't getting no hello, no greeting. Was good. What is going on here? What 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 is what is really going on? I don't know to say hi or to just look away. Amen. The funny thing is, is before we put on that attire, you know, we could walk through the casino and not really notice any difference. But the minute we all had that attire on, and of course we may have been in larger groups, uh, there was a recognizable difference in how we were greeted while we were wearing that African attire. And it is true that we're often afraid of things that we don't fully understand, even when it's just something as little as that, just, just a change of clothes. We have professionals from all over the country there. Put on some African attire, and like, uh, they're from Uganda, they're from Zimbabwe, or, or where are they from? Guess what? I was one of them too, because there were real Africans who were born in Africa, who have moved and live in the United States now, right among us, who were at the marriage retreat, and I couldn't tell who they were unless I was looking at something specific on them or something that, that would give me some kind of indi indication that they were there, a necklace or some kind of bracelet or something before. But once we all put on that, we all were one. Why do I say that? I say that because it's, it's, we have to understand that we can't buy into the world and be critical because someone looks and acts and, and, and seems different than we are, thinks different than we do, talks different than we do, and we put a label on them to be afraid of them. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The church should be able to do everything better than the world except sin. We love better. We embrace better. We welcome better. We share the word of gospel. Hey, guess what? I've got something that I carry out of this house every week. It's called the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everyone that I run into, I want to bring them that. Amen? I want to bring them that good news. You see, God knew what the people needed for nourishment. And they wanted meat. But God had provided manna. Manna 
came from heaven, the Bible says that manna was like coriander seed, and it fell from heaven. And as it fell from heaven, it fell with the dew. And the people would gather the, the, the manna in the mornings, and they would prepare the manna, and they would have to pound it out, and they would have to make it into uh, flour with a little oil, and then they would make cakes. And the Bible says it was really sweet to eat. It was like sweet cakes. It's good to taste. But you see, God knew what they needed, but they wanted what they had before. God knew what they needed now for nourishment in the desert, in this place of discomfort. But they wanted what they had before because they wanted to be comfortable. And they had not yet learned how to fear the Lord. They were in bondage, but now that they were free. Although they were, although they were free from the physical chains and the walls of captivity, they were still enslaved in their minds. Their physical bodies had been positioned and changed and moved, and they were far removed from the walls of captivity. But their minds, their hearts were still there. You see, God knows our hearts. He knows what's best for us, but yet he will still allow us to have what we want and what we cry out for, even if he knows it's not good for us. Amen? Have you ever gotten exactly what you thought you just had to have, only to realize it's, what, it's not what you wanted after all? Now I got it. Now how can I get rid of it? Amen? I got it and the pavements. Now how can I get rid of it? Amen? We ask for these things because we think we need them. And that's what the Lord was asking me. What do you want in this life? How many of you have an idea of what you want in this life when you were, had an idea when you were 18? By the time you were 25, uh, no. Did you settle for something less than what God wanted for you? Or were you thinking completely off track? Because I guarantee you what you want at 25 may not be the same thing you want at 50. After you've surrendered, after you've been through some things in your life, things have changed. See, the fear of the Lord in the life of the believer should be desired when we fully understand that he knows the very issues of our hearts. And it, it's his desire that we lose the mindset of bondage that limits him and empowers us and our flesh to continue to die a cruel and slow death, all because we think we know what's best for us. You should look at your neighbor right now and say, I thank God for my unanswered prayers. Thank God that your cries for this and that, God didn't answer them when he, when he could have. And he could have given you just what you wanted, but it wasn't what you needed. Amen? Sometimes, keeping it real, I'm just saying, I'm just keeping it real, God, if that shouldn't go further than the back of your front two teeth. Sometimes it's better just to I'm not going to say nothing, Lord. I'm just going to be thankful for where I am right now. I'm just going to be yielded to you where, for where I am right now, right? See, the children of Israel were not dissatisfied with the manna itself. They were dissatisfied with the process of having to gather it, of having to pound it out, of having to rely on God to provide their nourishment rather than them just going and grabbing something and preparing it. They had to solely rely on him. See, if you leave the world, guess what? The ways of the world have to leave too. And God's desire is that when you come out of the world, that you don't hang on to those things the way. This is the way I do it. Nope, not anymore. It's his way. It's his way above my way. God so desires for us to yield to him and understand that he knows us better than we know ourselves. Let me read something to you. Let's look at Psalms 139 and I'll close with this. As I meditated on this word this week, I began to really just see the Lord in a whole different light. 
as I begin to open up the book of Psalms again over the last month or so, I begin to see things that I haven't seen before. Psalms 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. O Lord, you have searched me, and you've known me. You know me when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and you're acquainted with all my ways. Verse 4. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend and rise to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the othermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. I, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is as light with you. For you form me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eye saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. Awake, and I am still with you. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked. O oh God, O oh man of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Amen. That passage, that psalm, really ministered to my heart that God knows us. He knows my heart. He knows my intentions. He knows my thoughts. He knows everything about me. Spirit, soul, and body. And if he knows those things, why wouldn't I desire to fear him? Why wouldn't I desire to look at him in awe and say, Lord, I don't want to ask for anything if it's not in your will for my life. God's desire is for us to be willing and obedient. Willing and obedient. Those of us who are will walk in the blessing of God. Those of us who are willing and obedient will see the blessing of God on our lives. But your willingness doesn't come naturally. Your willingness has to come as a result of of those things being stripped from your life. And I will say this, and we will close with this. When the children of Israel were rained down with quail, the Bible says that the quail was a day's walk away from the camp. And they had to get up, and they had to walk for hours in order to get this meat that they craved. The thing that they lusted for required more time, more energy than the manna that God provided for them daily. 
the Bible says that the manna and the dew fell together. That means that all they had to do was step out of their tent and gather what God had provided for them. You see, there was also another tent in the camp of Israel. It was called the tent of meeting. It was where the very presence of God would come and reside before the people in the cloud. It was there that the presence of God visited the camp. Because of their lust and their cravings for what they desired for themselves, God gave them meat. And he says, not only will you have this meat, but you're going to hate this meat. You're going to have so much of it that it is going to come out of your nose. See, the issue is, and the issue with us, is that because of their lusting and their craving, God put what outside of the camp what he did not want in the camp. And that's their craving. And they had to walk and use energy to go get it. And here's the key. Don't ever leave the presence of God and in what he has provided for you in that place to go get what you desire for yourself outside of his presence. Amen? Don't ever leave the presence of God to get what you want over what God has provided for you in his presence. Everything that you think is a blessing isn't. God knows you. God knows me. He knows what's best for us. I want you to pray this this morning as we close the service. God, please. Let's say it with some conviction. God, please, don't give me what I want because my cravings might kill me. God, please, Give me what I need because I know it's what's best for me and it will heal me. Help me, Lord, to fear you because I am known by you. Help me, Lord, to surrender my will to you. And as I walk in obedience, I will be blessed. Father, we give you all the praise and the glory for this this morning, Lord. If there's anyone here this morning who needs prayer, anyone here this morning who knows that you have, you have not yielded yourself to God, God has called you to follow him, and you've chosen a different route. But this morning, God ministered to your heart, and you know you need to respond. And you need to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you want to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, if you want to repent of your sins, walk away from your past, and follow him because he's going to give you life and life more abundantly, you can come meet me at the altar, and I will pray with you this morning. If you're looking for prayer over your life, over your issues, over your concerns, and you're just looking for someone to stand in agreement, I will stand in agreement with you as well. Father, we thank you for this time. We give you the blessing and honor. Bless these people as they go into their lives this week. May they carry the good news of the gospel into every area of it. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. God bless y'all. You're dismissed.